So hi, everyone. My name is Armin. Uh, I'm a biostatistics PhD candidate at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Bayesian modeling approaches to, to causal estimation and how we can uh, do that in STAN. So a lot of this was based on uh, a paper that we had been putting together, uh, myself and my co-advisor, Jason. Uh, and this is motivated largely by uh, a lot of the work that we've been doing over the, over the past several years on non-parametric Bayesian estimation um, uh, of causal effects. So uh, using non-parametric Bayesian models to, to tackle challenging causal inference problems. Uh, and it sort of hit us that, well, even if you're not doing a lot of this uh, fancier non-parametric stuff, um, Bayesian modeling can add a lot of value to causal estimation, even in very parametric settings. And maybe a lot of people uh, may not know about this, but it can actually be done fairly easily in open source software like SCAN. Uh, so we, that really motivated us to put together this paper uh, that's up on archive now uh, that sort of collects a lot of the Bayesian uh, literature, both from the parametric and non-parametric uh, side of, of, of causal estimation into one place and, and sort of uh, guides practitioners how uh, uh, th through, through this estimation process. Uh, so uh, here are some pretty pictures that will hopefully motivate you to, to go check out this, um, this paper. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about causality because I think most people here would be familiar with the Bayesian and, and the Stan portion, portion of this. Um, but when we're thinking about causal inference, we're largely thinking about making comparisons between these hypothetical worlds, um, uh, hypothetical worlds where, where people got one intervention and, and not the other, where maybe treated with one drug and not some other drug, or maybe it, it, um, uh, an intervention where everyone in the target population was vaccinated versus not vaccinated, or if they all got a job training program, what would uh, the reemployment rates have looked like? Uh, and uh, so I wanted to distinguish between the data that we actually observe and the data that we would want to, to have if we were doing causal estimation, because these aren't necessarily the same. And so what we observe is our, our entire population here and maybe we, we, have, we have this whole sample and then some portion, uh, a portion of these people uh, get treatment A equals one, and then we observe some outcome Y for them, and another portion gets treatment A equals zero. And if this isn't randomized, these two subsets might look very different from each other. Uh, so, so just straight up comparison between these two groups might, uh, might uh, result in some bias. But what we really want uh, is to know what would have happened if the entire um, sort of population uh, got treatment one, uh, what outcome would we, have, would, would we have observed? So that's this uh, uh, superscript notation here denotes this potential outcome under treatment one. Uh, and then what would, have, what would have things looked like if, if everyone uh, got treatment zero, right? So we wanna make this comparison, uh, but we observe uh, this. Uh, and so we, um, we are really trying to make, um, we, we'll need some identification assumptions to actually t tie in the observed data with, uh, with these uh, counterfactual measures. Uh, and so suppose we have, we have the setting where we observed this outcome uh, Y, some treatment, uh, confounders L, uh, and then some strata V, so we can maybe these are ethnicity uh, strata, and we want to compute causal effects within each, each of these strata. And we have these potential outcomes, uh, the potential outcome that would have been observed uh, under treatment little a, right? And so we might want to compute this type of causal estimate, this average uh, conditional average treatment effect uh, within strata little v. So what would have been, uh, what would have the average difference in outcomes have been had everyone in strata v been treated uh, versus untreated. And so using these identification assumptions that I mentioned, we can compute each term of the psi uh, by just integrating a regression model of the outcome on treatment stratum uh, and, and, and regressing on confounders uh, over the confounder distribution. Right? So there's a regression here denoted by, by mu. We'll need to estimate that statistically. We'll need an estimate of the confounder distribution. And if we have that, we can just perform this integration and then, and then compute each term of the causal estimate. Uh, so now this is really a statistical problem and we can throw 
uh, some, some Bayesian uh, tools at it. Uh, so uh, we could think of parametric approaches where now this regression is parameterized by these, uh, by these um, beta coefficients and there's some link function G here. Uh, and so we, we just need a prior on these, on these regression coefficients and that induces a prior on the mean function. But then there are all these non-parametric approaches too, where we could just leave this, the, the, this, the form here unspecified. Instead of specifying this linear additive form, maybe we just uh, leave it vaguely as F, but then we need a, a prior on F, right? So something like a Gaussian process. And I'll be mostly talking about these parametric approaches here, but the paper discusses both. Uh, so why do Bayes at all? Um, why not just do this in a, in, a, in a frequentist way? And I think there are a lot of unique advantages that Bayes brings to the table. Uh, in particular, we can, it helps us compute causal effects under conditions of sparsity, uh, which is a realistic, uh, which is a realistic setting. Even if you have very large data, there might be particular regions of your data that that are sparse. Um, it helps us avoid certain ad hoc approaches uh, to handling sparsity. Uh, and also there's this really, uh, really powerful set of non-parametric models like, like BART and Dirichlet processes and Gaussian processes that give you sort of a lot of the flexibility that you would get from typical machine learning methods, uh, but also gives you uncertainty quantification through via like, full posterior inference. And then lastly, we can, we can do probabilistic sensitivity analyses um, around those identification assumptions that I mentioned, which is a benefit that's really unique to causal inference, I think. Uh, so, so like I'll, I'll consider this one synthetic example that I'll walk through in, in the rest of the slides. So suppose here that the outcome is binary and then we have these five ethnicity strata and then we, we wanna estimate this logistic regression. Um, so, we have these stratum specific intercepts and then we have these uh, strata specific uh, conditional treatment effects, these theta Vs. Uh, and so all these parameters here together, I'm calling omega. Uh, and so we need priors on, 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 on all these parameters and then we could do posterior inference on this regression, right? And then one thing to consider is, okay, well, what type of prior would be sensible for these uh, stratum specific treatment effects, especially when these strata, some of these strata might be sparsely populated. Uh, and so one, one prior that would be useful in this setting uh, is, is this partial pooling type prior, where you might say that, okay, all of these uh, stratum-specific conditional effects, they all are distributed around some overall effect theta star uh, with dispersion control by phi. And so this gives us a shrinkage type of interpretation, right? Maybe we're shrinking these individual race effects towards a common effect. There's also this belief type of interpretation where, okay, do, maybe we don't think that, that, that race effects should all, should all be that different. Like maybe we, we think these differences should be small and we wanna express that prior belief. Uh, and then there's also some causal intuition here, right? We're, we're estimating conditional average treatment effects, conditional on these strata. Um, but what if uh, we, we a priori don't think that the treatment effects are heterogeneous across ethnicity? What if we think they're homogenous? And, and so this very small fee here lets us aggressively shrink towards a homogenous causal effect. Uh, and so like, if you think of a setting where it's strata four and five are sparsely populated, one ad hoc thing people might do is they, they might just collapse these two categories together into an other category and estimate a single effect in, among others, or even not even report that estimate. Right? So that actually, in this setting, that corresponds to roughly speaking, um, a setting where you're where you're setting phi to something near zero, right? S sufficiently near zero such that the difference between the effects of stratum four and five are, is is a point mass at zero. You can view it as being drawn from prior point mass at zero. Uh, and so it's we it's interesting that when people if people try to avoid doing this partial pooling thing and then actually do this other ad hoc thing where you're collapsing collapsing categories, that actually corresponds to a very informative uh, prior. And, and that's a constant theme throughout our paper uh, is we, we always stress when these ad hoc things that people do correspond to, to very informative uh, Bayesian priors. And maybe they, maybe they don't even realize it. Uh, and and so, uh, so we have this model for the regression and maybe we want to estimate this causal odds ratio. Right, so on the numerator here of, of psi of B, 
we have uh, the odds of the outcome under treatment one for, for strata V. And then on the, on, on the de in the denominator, we have the odds of the outcome uh, under treatment zero for, for strata V. And so again, like we can compute each of these expectations using G computation, like we discussed, just integrate the logistic regression of the confounder distribution. But then what about the, the confounder distribution? How do we estimate that? And one frequentist estimate uh, would just be the empirical distribution, right? Just put, put weight one over N on each of the uh, observed confounder vectors, right? This is sort of like a bootstrap. Uh, and then a Bayesian model would say, well, I don't feel comfortable keeping uh, this, the, these uh, weights fixed at one over n. Realistically, I don't know what these weights are, and I want to express some prior uncertainty about it. Uh, so I'll just call these weights p, p i, and then I want to put some prior on on these vector probabilities that sum to one. Uh, so the appropriate prior here might be this flat Dirichlet process prior, and then if you do that, you get a conjugate posterior for the weights, right? That are centered over over the frequentist estimate essentially. Uh, so this is like the Bayesian bootstrap. It's a, so we can, now we can do full posterior inference for, for, the, um, for the distribution of confounders without making too many strict parametric assumptions about, uh, about it. And in terms of MCMC inference, this is fairly straightforward. You can use uh, whatever you want to get these posterior draws of the parameters, these omega uh, superscript M here gives you, it, it denotes the mth draw of the, of the uh, logistic regression parameters. So we'll do this in STAN. Uh, but then for each treatment group and each stratum, you compute the predicted probability for each person here, um, uh, the, predicted, the predicted probability of the outcome uh, uh, under each treatment, uh, under the, that, the posterior draws, the current posterior draws of your parameters. You take a draw of your Bayesian bootstrap weights from the posterior, and then you just plug it into your standardization estimate. So now we integrate this logistic regression uh, over the confounder distribution, which we estimate using the Bayesian bootstrap, right? So we approximate this integral now uh, with, with this sum. And that gives us an mth draw of, of, the, um, of, of the mean potential outcome under treatment little a. Uh, and then now that we have that, we, it's a matter of arithmetic to, to then do the divisions and compute a causal odds ratio. So here, uh, doing this many, many times gives us a, whole, a, a set of posterior draws for this causal odds ratio in each strata, uh, in each stratum of B. Uh, and so this can be implemented pretty easily in the generated quantities block in STAN. So here I'm just taking a, a draw of weights from the Dirichlet, uh, uh, from a Dirichlet posterior, uh, and then I'm computing the conditional mean uh, of the outcome under both interventions for every single person. And then in, in these two lines here, computing marge underscore mean underscore y, I'm applying the Bayesian bootstrap, uh, the Bayesian bootstrap weights, and then computing the odds ratio for each stratum. Uh, and th these are the results in just one stylized synthetic example. So in blue here are the posterior mean and, and, and uh, interval estimates for these stratum specific odds ratios. And the dotted line here is the overall effect. And in black here are the MLEs. Uh, so we, we see that for these sparsely populated ethnicity groups four and five here, um, we, we've aggressively shrunk them towards the overall effect. But then for these more well-populated strata, uh, there's less shrinkage going on. So this gives you a little bit of um, a compromise between this ad hoc collapsing of sparse categories uh, versus just computing a, an average effect across all races, right? It says, well, don't compute an average effect, but don't do this collapsing either. Uh, maybe just uh, have a prior that balances the, these, these two uh, uh, causal effect estimates. And I want to use the remaining time to talk about sensitivity analysis. Uh, and so remember that identification require, uh, required many uh, assumptions to get from observed data to potential outcomes. And one of the more important assumptions here is conditional ignorability assumption. So uh, within, each strata, within each strata, once we condition on these confounders L, then the actual treatment assignment should be as good as random. It shouldn't be related to the potential outcome that would have occurred under that treatment at all. 
Uh, so it's not like people who got treated with treatment little a were systematically going to have better outcomes under that treatment anyway. Uh, that that would lead to bias, right? So, but uh, and if ignorability is violated, if this does not hold, uh, then actually the mean potential outcome under either treatment uh, might be systematically different between those who got treated and those who didn't. And so we say, okay, if these aren't equal, let's, let's actually calibrate the difference. And we'll just call this difference delta here, delta superscript A. Um, so, so here we're, we're not assuming that these two, two expectations are equal as they would, would be if the ignorability assumption holds. Uh, instead, we're, we're assuming that, it, that there's some positive difference here. Uh, and in the end, we want to put a prior on this. So it turns out that if ignorability doesn't hold and you perform your standardization procedure, as we discussed, you'll get a biased estimate. You know, this is, will be equal to your um, average difference, um, average difference potential outcomes within that stratum plus some bias C. Uh, and so a lot of sensitivity analysis, this isn't really a Bayesian thing, it's more of a causal thing, but a lot of sensitivity analysis then involves trade-offs, um, involves simplifying assumptions about the nature of the violation. You can make the nature of the violation arbitrarily complex, but then you might not have a very intuitive sensitivity analysis. On the other hand, if you simplify too much, you might not explore realistic violations. Uh, and, and so this, this is the trade-off that, that everyone needs to make, whether they're Bayesian or frequentist or whatever, if you're doing sensitivity analysis. In this case, we'll make a simplifying assumption that the bias uh, in, in the difference in either potential outcome is just going to be the same. So it's just a single delta. Uh, and then that's going to be independent of confounders. And in this case, our bias term will be, uh, C will be just delta. And now we can specify priors over, over this bias that reflect our um, uncertainty about the magnitude and the direction uh, of the ignorability violation. So uh, recall, if this is the risk difference here, um, then this difference is going to be between negative one and one. Uh, and so if higher, um, if higher outcomes uh, here are worse, uh, then, and we believe that treated patients are going to be doing systematically worse, then we think delta is going to be positive, right? So maybe we specify a, a uniform a prior between zero and one for delta. But if we have prior reason to think that treated patients might be doing systematically better, then we might specify um, a uniform negative one to zero uh, prior on delta. And if we're not really sure about the direction of the effect, but we're pretty sure there's some ignorability violation, we might just specify a uniform negative one, one prior. And what this will do is actually it'll increase our, um, inter the width of our posterior intervals uh, for, for the risk difference. And that makes sense because now we have additional uncertainty about whether or not the ignorability assumption holds. Uh, and then of course, like the trivial case, if you think that the ignorability does hold, that corresponds to a prior where Delta uh, follows a Dirac uh, distribution at zero. Um, and so all of these things can be easily fit and Stan, like, and, and the MCMC requires very little modification. You just take your usual standardization estimate, right? Here are your Bayesian bootstrap weights. Here's a mean function. But now you're subtracting off a draw from your prior. So you're, so you're subtracting off that bias that you think is there. And you can do this in the generated quantities block. You can do this in the, you can specify prior for delta in the models block. I think either one works. And lastly, I'll leave you with some resources here. Uh, all the code for, 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 the, for this talk and for the paper that I mentioned, there, it's all available on GitHub, so you can feel free to uh, run it. And as always, um, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or, or comments. Thank you.